I'm glad to have this chance to talk with you about the global movement of church planting and disciple making. My name is Stan Parks, and I'm part of the 2414 facilitation team. I'm vice president of global strategies with Beyond, and I'm also part of the Ethne leadership team. We all know the Great Commission in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. We recognize that this is Jesus' command and commission to us to go and reach the entire world. And we know that this will happen. Matthew 24, 14 says, and this good news of the king's reign will be heralded throughout the whole world as a sacrificial witness to every people group, and then the end will come. Now, we don't know when the end will come, but we do know it won't come until every people group in the world has had the opportunity to hear about the kingdom of God. And we know that at the end of history, that Revelation 7 tells us that before the throne, there will be a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they will be wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they will cry out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so we know that history is leading toward this conclusion where God is gathering his entire bride from every tribe and nation and language and people to worship him before the throne. But we recognize that there are problems that are stopping this from happening. There are barriers in today's world keeping these uh, prophecies from being fulfilled in our generation. One of the main things that we see is that we are losing ground. Uh, every, in, one out of every three people in the world still does not have access to the gospel message. That means that even if they want to know the good news, they don't have the opportunity. We know that evangelism of unreached peoples is not keeping pace with the rate of population growth. In 1985, 3.2 billion people in the world were lost, were, were separated from God for eternity. Today, that number is 6.1 billion people lost souls in our generation. If we look at 1985, 1.44 billion people did not have access to the gospel. They were considered uh, unevangelized or unreached with the gospel. Today, that number has grown to 2.3 billion people without access to the gospel. So not only is the, the total number of people cut off far larger, but the percentages of people are not improving. So we know that this is totally unacceptable to God. He does not wish that any would perish, but that all would come to eternal life. We also know he will fulfill his promises. So what will God do to fulfill Revelation 7? What will he do so that there will be worshipers from every tribe and language and people and nation? What is the solution? What is God doing? Not what are we doing? Not what can we figure out, but what are we seeing God do to change this reality? What is the solution that he is beginning to uh, enact in the world today? God shows us one of the keys to reaching the unreached in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. He says, make disciples of all nations, every ethnic. 
So we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we disciple entire people groups? Not just a few individuals, but make disciples of the ethne. We're seeing God start movements among the unreached, among unreached people groups. These church planting movements grow rapidly and often exceed the population growth rate. And in the last 20 plus years, the number of movements has increased dramatically, spreading to every continent. We're seeing Matthew 28 fulfilled in many places where multiplying movements of disciples and churches are reaching their own people. They are literally seeing thousands and in a few cases, even millions of disciples brought into the kingdom. But to see the Great Commission fulfilled, we need multiplying movements in every people group and every place so that there are no more unreached people. In our generation, we pray and ask God to remove the term unreached from our vocabulary so that everyone has access to the good news of Jesus Christ. These movements are called church planting movements because churches plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. Other times people talk about kingdom movements where the kingdom of God is breaking forth in um, great ways and transforming people in those areas. Others talk about gospel movements. Others talk about disciple making movements where disciples make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. Really what we're saying is whatever the term you use, all of these terms can describe the same phenomenon. Basically, we want to see the book of Acts happen in every people group, in every place, in every nation. We want to see the kind of rapid spread of the gospel, the, the rapid transformation of people's lives. We want to see that happen, not over hundreds of years, but in this generation, in every single people group, in every single place. In Acts 19, Paul goes to Ephesus. <clears throat> he finds a few uh, people who knew only the baptism of John, and then he teaches in the synagogue, and after opposition rises there, he moves to the hall of Tyrannus and begins to teach there every day. And Acts 19.10 tells us that this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And Roman census tells us that that province, which is roughly equivalent to modern day Turkey, uh, Asia Minor, roughly 15 million people lived in that province at that time. And so how did 15 million people hear the word of the Lord? It could not have been Paul and a few people preaching to 15 million people. It had to have been training and equipping people who then went out and shared with others and trained to equip them to go out and share with others. And so you see this rapid spread of the gospel through rapid a disciple making in that province. So what will it take for Acts 19.10 to happen in every province, in every city, in every nation today? So the term church planting movement was created to describe what God was doing. This was not a term that people defined and then went out and started a movement. Instead, they said, look at what God's doing. What do we call what God is doing? And they called what he was doing a church planning movement. And we've seen church planning movements all throughout history, whether it was uh, Patrick and those that went to Ireland and within a generation, many of the Irish had become followers of Jesus or uh, those same Irish going and reaching many different people groups throughout Europe, or in modern times, uh, the Nagas of Northeast India and that portion of South Asia, uh, many, many of them coming to faith and becoming uh, missionaries to other people groups around them. These movements God has done throughout history, but for the first time ever, we're seeing God do these movements 
all throughout the world in every single continent. So this is one actual example of a diagram showing uh, the beginnings of a church planting movement. Each box represents a church, the, the writing in there represents the leaders um, and sometimes even the location of the church. And as they are multiplying, you'll notice the lines show generational. So you'll have a church and then a line to its daughter church and then a line to its grandchild church and then a line to its grand great-grandchildren and great-great-great-grandchildren. And you can see just this spontaneous expansion of the church as God is birthing new churches through everyday normal disciples on a regular basis. Now, church planting movements have some things in common. In these movements, there's the belief that every believer can and should reach the lost. This is not just for a few people. It's not just for professionals. Every believer can and should do this. They believe that God works miracles through normal people because they see God doing this over and over again. They're following the typical pattern in scripture where they're finding groups of lost people, a family or a community, and they're sharing the gospel with them. Once this group is saved, sometimes one person comes to faith and leads the rest of their family or community of faith. Sometimes you see the entire group or most of the group come to faith together. That, that group of saved people is baptized and they begin to become a church. It, it's like a church is born. It's a baby church. They begin to meet together and worship and read the word and share their faith. And from that baby church, the church begins to grow and mature. The churches emphasize obedience-based discipleship. Jesus said in the Great Commission, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, not just to know what I've commanded you, but to obey what I've commanded you. And so they're not teaching knowledge discipleship. The more you know, the better a disciple you are. They're teaching obedience discipleship. The things you know, you should obey. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers also. The church planner uh, leads the new believers to discover what church should look like according to scripture. Not according to the pattern the church planners used to, but according to scripture. The church planner doesn't have the answers. They point these new believers to scripture and the Holy Spirit guides them into all truth as the new believers discover this truth. Uh, the church planner is a guide, a help, but they're only facilitating this, these new believers learning directly from God, John 6, uh, where it says that the Father himself will teach them. And then in the Holy Spirit is guiding them into all truth. And as the new believers are learning, they naturally find other groups of unbelievers. At first, these are families or groups in their own community, and they share the gospel with them. And they repeat that same process of helping these new uh, people become believers and new churches are started. And so we see this pattern, very simple pattern, very natural pattern, uh, like Roland Allen's book, the, the Spontaneous Expansion of the Church. The church will expand if we don't, if we don't limit it, if we don't stop it. If instead we encourage and let it biblically be a led, be, be spirit led, to reproduce, to make disciples, and start new churches. These movements are multiplying because they reach families and groups and not just individuals. The, the numbers multiply rather than just uh, addition. Uh, everyone is a disciple maker. Every church starts other churches. And because of this, growth becomes exponential. Uh, two churches become four, and four become eight, and eight become 16, and 16 become 32, and 64, and 128, and 256. Now, it's never, never, ever that precise. 
but you can see the power of multiplication. Uh, these movements are messy. They, like much of the New Testament was written to address problems in new churches. So these new churches have some of the very same problems we see in the, in the uh, New Testament church. But like the New Testament church, they're vital, they're growing, they're reaching others, and then God is correcting them and leaders are helping them deal with sin and error and other problems, but the church continues to grow. These are indigenous churches. The outsider, our job is to remove our own external baggage, the extras we've added that in our culture may be fine, they may be good, but they're not biblically necessary. And so we wanna take off the unnecessary extras share as close as possible to the scripture alone. And then these new groups within these new cultures, this cross-cultural effort, they're led by the Holy Spirit, they're taught by the Father to share and live out the gospel in their own culture. And so these movements are multiplying, but they're also very indigenous because God is the one leading them. Scripture is their guide and obedience uh, protects them from seeking knowledge without uh, obeying and following the Father. Some of the markers of movements. When does something move from some initial growth to what we would consider to be a movement? And what we call it a movement because once it reaches that stage, it will probably continue to grow and continue to um, mature. And so, one of the markers is that it's reproductive in multiple streams, consistently at least four generations, great, great grandchildren of churches being started. Marker is rapid. It may take years to start, but once it starts, each generation reproduces every 12 to 18 months. So in three to five years, you're hitting that four generation and beyond uh, measure. So I want to tell you about some exciting things that God is doing around the world throughout his body. There are 4,500 plus reports of active CPM teams, CPM efforts, people trying to start movements. In recent years, we've been thrilled to realize that God has started over 1,300 of these church planting movements where they are saying, four generations and beyond, many of them, 10, 15, 20, even more generations of churches. All of those movements put together and all the movement efforts are almost 77 million disciples. And there are 4.7 million known churches in all of these CPM engagements. Each Church planting movement on average has 56,000 believers within that movement. So the average church in these movements is 16 believers. And some of that is because they meet in homes. And so that they don't have more space than that. Uh, some of it has to do with being in uh, dangerous situations where there's high persecution. And so they meet in smaller groups. Often these churches uh, are clusters of churches where the elders might be appointed over uh, five or 10 churches rather than on one smaller church. So as you can see, these numbers represent God's incredible work around the world. And some people say, well, I don't even believe that's happening. And my question to them would be, why not? This is God. God's the one for whom nothing is impossible. And our prayer is that this is just the start of what God will do, where there will be far, far more uh, people being reached for the gospel. And these movements will sweep throughout the entire unreached world and even in, throughout the entire world. So as we look at the engagements on the uh, continuum scale, so this first column would be those who are trying to start movements, but are not yet uh, seeing movements happen. The second would be emerging. They're not yet movements, but they're seeing some second, third, and even the initial uh, fourth generation churches emerge. But they're not consistently for 
generations and beyond. And then you can see a pretty significant number over uh, that, are, that are consistently at the movement four generations and beyond stage. And then some of the movements are uh, strong and sustained and more mature, and many of them are actually starting other movements uh, in their surrounding uh, near neighbor and sometimes further away people groups. If we look around the world, you'll see these movements are spread throughout the world. And so yellow would be CPM engagements. Uh, obviously, Asia has the most, but Africa has quite a few. Uh, Europe and the Americas, the Pacific, had actually begun more slowly to embrace movements because the traditional patterns have uh, often kept people from trying some of these uh, new and yet ancient New Testament patterns that God's using to start movements. You'll see from the red that there are CPMs in all different parts of Africa and Asia and Europe and even the Americas and in the Pacific. And so God is doing this literally throughout the entire world. We can see this is not all the movements, but from the start dates that we have on some movements, you can see the number of movements as it continues to go up. The increase in churches is more exponential. And so you can see just this beginning of a huge exponential jump, uh, even from 2005 to 10 was significant, and then another five years significant, and then a, a very, very significant jump. Again, we hope this is just the beginning of what God is doing. Now, there's some myths about these movements. One myth is, well, you know, some areas are too hard for movements. And as you just saw, the reality is this is happening in every continent, every worldview. It's happening in urban areas. It's happening in rural areas. That uh, there are no movements here. People say, oh, I live in that country or I live in that province and I live in that city. And someone reports a movement. I don't see it. Well, the reality is that most church planning movements are still very small. They're less than 0.1% of the population. And particularly in areas where there's high persecution, they're hide from everyone when they're small. They meet in homes. They use the local languages. They use local music. You could literally be walking by and not recognize that that is a church of Jesus because it just sounds like what other people in that area would do. Some people say, well, you know, these must be, if they're rapidly growing, there must be shallow growth. I'd encourage you to read in the New Testament how many times it talks about the gospel spread rapidly. The, the myth is rapid equals shallow. The truth is that these church planting movements often lead to rapid maturity. They're focused on immediate obedience, on immediate sharing. Their focus is not on being rapid. Their focus is on being immediate. And because they immediately obey and immediately share, they begin to see a rapid growth. Of now, there are two ways movements are being started. One is by new catalysts, these outside catalysts coming from one country or one culture to a different culture, crossing cultures, often having to learn a new language. But we're also seeing movements start other movements. So we do want to train, equip, and coach new catalysts. There's still a need. There are many, many, many unreached people groups that still need new catalysts to be deployed. And we've learned better how to train these catalysts because of what we've seen God do in these. But Movements, starting movements, are the main way, are the most effective way we're seeing movements get started. Easily over 1,000 of these 1,300 movements have been started by other CPMs. The number is probably larger, but we know at least 80% uh, or so have been started by existing CPM. This changes everything. If the most effective way to reach a lost world is through movements, and the most effective way to start movements is to help a movement start another movement, then we must change our strategy to reflect that new reality. And so how can we serve movements? Not how can I go start a movement, but how can I serve an existing movement as an outsider to help prioritize prayer, 
funding personnel in ways that will support the existing movements as they expand to new people groups, new places, new language groups, new provinces, new countries. So the vision that we all share, that FTT shares, that every other Great Commission Christian around the world shares is that the good news of Jesus Christ will be provided for every person and a church will be established for every people group. Now, how do we accomplish that vision? The vision is what we want to see God do. The mission is how do we cooperate and serve God to see that vision come true? And the best way we've seen God do this is through these kingdom movements, through these church planning movements in all unreached peoples and every place. And so 2414, is a coalition of these 1,300 plus church planning movements, as well as other church planning teams and organizations and churches and networks, uh, groups like GACX and GCPN and FTT uh, Korea and FTT Global. Uh, many mission agencies, many teams are saying, we together want to work we want to pray and we want to work together to start kingdom movement engagements in every unreached people in place by the end of 2025. Only God decides when a movement starts, but we know if there's no one there trying to start a movement that we have not done our part. We all wanna be a part of fulfilling the Great Commission, but it's the wrong question to ask, what can I do? Instead, we have to ask the question, what must be done? Not what can I do, but what must be done? And then ask God to take us as a global body and do the things that must be done to see movements in every unreached people and place. And so we must first put God's glory over all other motivations. We are not pursuing movements for movement's sake. We're not pursuing missions for mission's sake. We're not fulfilling the Great Commission to accomplish the task. We want to see God's name glorified throughout the nations. We want to see the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth like water covers the sea. We need to strategically collaborate for movements, not conventional approaches. Conventional approaches, there are many good things happening but we're losing ground. We have to take all of these conventional efforts and put them together in a collaborative effort to see movements start and see movements begin to reach the unreached people. We have to attempt the impossible for God. We have to have a God-sized vision that unless God does it, will never happen. We must ask God to lead us into extraordinary prayer and fasting as we fight in this global spiritual battle. And we have to do this with sacrificial urgency. The people in our generation will never have another opportunity. They're waiting for us to bring them the good news of Jesus. And we must be willing to sacrifice in order to see this happen. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, but there will be a generation that will rise up to run the final lap of the Great Commission race. Why not us? So Lord, our prayer is that you would be glorified, that you would start movements of multiplying disciples and churches so that every people group, every place is reached with the good news, that every community is transformed by your presence and your power. We ask you to do this to glorify your name.